Good morning. My name is Su Ling Ching, and it is my honor to be the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Thank you and congratulations for joining us for this important conversation about small and medium business, the impact of the pandemic, and living on the financial edge. Over the course of the last 20 months, we have been advocating for policies and programs to support businesses. We have provided key information and access to services and have convened with business and community leaders, politicians and decision makers to ensure the interests of the business community are heard. One such group of dedicated volunteers were the members of the SME Council. They have been meeting weekly or bi-weekly since the beginning of the pandemic to provide input, identify emerging issues and create solutions. They have created an OBOT SME strategy to support the SME community, resources, advocacy, collaboration, and education. Today's program is brought to you as part of our intention to provide meaningful information and education for you to use as business leaders to grow or pivot your business. Thank you to our council members, Margot Crawford of Business Sherpa Group and Warren Wilkinson of Colliers for your leadership in this webinar series, get growing. Warren, I leave it to you. Thank you very much, Su Ling. Uh, really appreciate the introduction um, and, and very well said. Uh, I joined the, the SME committee um, in the middle of the pandemic. And, and one of the reasons I, I chose this committee, uh, which was important to me is because um, as a um, commercial real estate, full service commercial real estate firm, uh, one of the areas that we deal with, of course, is uh, client facing, uh, in a myriad of different uh, avenues, right? We see, we see retail, industrial, we see office, and we, we deal with investors uh, in, in, in either large complexes or individual assets. And, you know, one of the things that I kept hearing from the conversations with the clients is the things that they're struggling with, especially during the pandemic. If it's not labor shortages, it's the actual growing price of labor. Um, it's rental changes. Uh, and then pile on top of that, all of the issues and frankly, some of the confusion around policies when it comes to reopening. And one thing that was always in the back of their mind was this, this potential threat of insolvency. And so when, I, when, when we came up with the, uh, the thought about how we could use our Get Growing series to, uh, to help educate some of the members and give them resources, I thought this would be a great initiative to get into. So um, that's the reason why I, I, I joined it and I, I wanted to kind of spearhead this with my partner, uh, Margot Crawford. So uh, again, a little bit about Colliers International, uh, full service commercial real estate firm. I manage the brokerage side of things. Um, and uh, yeah, really excited to participate and, and, and put the time, energy and effort in. Uh, Margot? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And uh, yeah, really nice to be here and with everyone in our panelists. Um, so again, my name is Margot Crawford. I'm the founder and CEO of a company uh, named Business Sherpa Group. And Business Sherpa Group works with small and mid-sized businesses, primarily working in their business operations functions, finance, HR, information management, marketing, et cetera, and try to support, um, support small businesses with uh, professionals who can come in in a fractional way. So I joined the um, SME Council just prior to the pandemic. Um, so it was just kind of lurking on the edge. And then we, we went in and as Su Ling mentioned, we were quickly meeting weekly to really navigate all the challenges that were being faced, which was so dynamic and difficult. Um, and really it's been ongoing and fluid. Um, and you know, for, for me joining, joining this, uh, well, OBOT, but also participating in this panel was from the sense of just seeing a lot of businesses that did struggle, um, tried to find a way through, had a lot of levers available to them and new ones that came from the government, but there's also other types of levers available as businesses struggle. And I think that that was what we really felt that we wanted to tackle this particular topic, understanding it's not just an endpoint, there's actually a complete journey and things for people to learn throughout. So uh, really excited to have the group with us today and, and dive into uh, this topic that, you know, as a business owner, we know it lurks in the back of everyone's mind. And we wanna kind of, you know, take the bushel away from it and just get the facts and debunk some of the myths. So with that, um, I think we'll dive in. And what we'll start with is 
like to, um, you know, go to each of our panelists, ask each of you just maybe to do an introduction uh, of yourself and the context to this subject. You know, if you could take just a couple of minutes and, and let us know about the background and, and how this topic of bankruptcy and insolvency intersects with what you do in your life. So Chantal, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I'm Chantal Gingra. I'm a licensed insolvency trustee with Ginsburg Gingra and Associates. Um, and we have offices in Eastern Ontario and across the province of Quebec. Um, I, how I kind of fit into this, this is what I do. We used to be called trustees in bankruptcy, but bankruptcy is only a small portion of what we do. Um, so essentially, we help people navigate through insolvency processes, um, we, we also can act as consultants. Um, so again, it's when people have financial difficulties, we always encourage that they seek um, at least advice or a preliminary meeting with a licensed insolvency trustee to at least help get rid of some of the stigma and some of the questions a lot of people have. And I'm hoping that this webinar might answer a lot of the questions that are always in the back of people's head, but you don't want to go see a licensed insolvency trustee because you don't want to file for bankruptcy. So great. Hopefully Thanks, we'll talk about it today. Thank you. Um, uh, Ted. Oh, Ted, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I talk all too much, so I have to make sure that I'm on mute as much as possible. <laughs> uh, so my name is Ted Mann. I am the founder and uh, recently stepped back as managing partner of Mann Lawyers. We are a full service law firm with offices in Ottawa and Perth. Um, I, my connection with uh, bankruptcy and insolvency is I have taught the bankruptcy and insolvency course at the University of Ottawa Law School for the past 20 years. Uh, and in connection uh, with teaching that course, I've kept myself up to speed with all of the changes that have occurred over the year in, in the legislation. In my practice, uh, insolvency has touched every aspect of my practice, real estate, corporate commercial, uh, even you know, family issues. Uh, and, uh, and so I have found myself uh, giving advice to clients, uh, for the most part, to clients who are contemplating insolvency, although there is also a place for lawyers in the, process, in, the, in the insolvency process. And so that's how I'm involved. Great. Thanks, Tate. Ted. Um, and Dave, over to you. Margo. Uh, so I've, um, I'm a chronic entrepreneur, I guess you could say, like some of our, our, our attendees here probably are that are watching today. Um, 23 years as an entrepreneur, 17 years in my first company and six in my second. <clears throat> I'm here really to talk about a bit of my story, I guess. Uh, maybe to, to start, I'd, I'd just throw out a question to, to the audience of, of, that's here to think about is that, you know, as an owner, an entrepreneur, you know, what is the greatest fear you have, not just for your company, but for your career? And I suspect if you're anything like me, the answer would be bankruptcy, right? It is that uh, I like to think of bankruptcy as the mental health issue of business. It's the stigma. It's this thing we don't talk about. It's, um, it's there's a stigma attached to it that we're all fearful of. Um, and yet, uh, it, once you lift the hood up and, and experience it as challenging and difficult as it can be, <clears throat> it can be um, one of the most important decisions that can be made. Um, and I guess I'm a little bit living proof of that. Uh, when I was facing the brink, I'll say, um, there was a company and we were about $400,000, facing about $400,000 of revenue in that upcoming year and somewhere in the range of two to $3 million of obligations. It was a company that needed to, uh, to end, uh, frankly, at that point. And frankly, if I'd had access to this kind of information, I think we're gonna talk about today, it probably would have been a decision that had made uh, several years before that. Um, and so I'm hoping that through this, that, you know, we have a chance here to, um, to, to provide some clarity for people, um, some reassurance. I think that's a big part of this is the support to go through this. It's a big step if that's the case. And I should also mention, you know, bankruptcy is, um, as part of this, is the end point. Um, there's a lot that goes on before that and may never get to that stage of bankruptcy. Um, so there's a lot to this than just about uh, whether or not a person's going back or the company's going bankrupt. So very happy to be here, Margo, and uh, Warren to be part of this and um, to help uh, those out there who are, are facing some challenging times. Great. Thanks, Dave. Really look forward to that perspective. And Fraser. Thanks, Margot, and thanks, Warren, for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. 
Uh, my name is Fraser Patterson. I'm the Director of Retail Leasing at Colonnade Bridgeport. We're a, a full service, uh, third party and owners, um, managers of commercial real estate and multi-residential, which we've recently gotten into as well. Uh, we manage about 9 million square feet of office, industrial and retail space in Ottawa and the Western GTA. Um, I manage about 1.2 to 1.4 million square feet of retail. Uh, so certainly dealing with a lot of small businesses as they uh, work through their leases and potential renewals or potentially trying to give back those leases. So that's kind of my involvement. I'm also involved with the Orleans BIA. I'm a board member there. So dealing with a lot of small businesses there as well, um, trying to support them and help them as they uh, try and guide their way through the the commercial leasing side of and their spaces, which often is one of their bigger expenses. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much, Fraser. Uh, so just uh, in turn, we'll dive into, we've got a whole bunch of questions that is mentioned in the chat. Um, please feel free to uh, to ask your questions. And so you know, uh, nobody can see who's asking, it's only going to the panelists. So it's, it's anonymous in that sense. Um, and Warren and I are going to circle through uh, questions and uh, hopefully we'll cover a lot of topics, but yes, feel free to, to uh, bring your own thoughts as you hear more from, from our, our group today. So Warren, over to you. Great, thanks Margo and, and you know, Fraser, Chantal, Ted and Dave, really appreciate you guys again, uh, giving up your time for this. Um, so we'll start, I think around some questions uh, around headspace, you know, where, where someone might be as they're contemplating uh, filing uh, for bankruptcy and, uh, you know, facing that difficult challenge of insolvency. And um, David, if I can, I, I'll start with you. Um, and, and, you know, thank you for very much, honestly, for the courage to, to, to speak about it. This panel needed that um, boots on the ground, lived it type of experience. And uh, by taking that stigma away is by talking about it and, you uh, I know for myself and the balance of the panelists here, really appreciate it. So tell us in your experience, you know, what are some of the biggest myths about bankruptcy and insolvency um, that, that you either thought that you knew about it or that uh, you would like to help our audience know about and dispel? Well, that's a great question. And uh, I could probably spend an hour talking about the number of myths out there that I think are there, but I'll, I'll stick to some of the big ones here that I think are there. Um, first of all, I think uh, as an entrepreneur, without knowing much about the world of bankruptcy, um, the perspective is very much that you think bankruptcy is a black and white issue, right? And, and, and actually, bankruptcy ultimately is a bit more of a black and white issue once you get there. But there's a long gap between when a company is not really viable and when it's bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is simply a process at some point that may be necessary for, for dealing with that situation. Um, and so that was a huge part of my learning process on this is that, you know, it, there is a lot more uh, control or not, uh, there, you know, there's constraints as you get into financial uh, challenges that are there. But there's still a lot of control um, for the company owner about, you know, so where your destiny is going to be with this, where what you want to be able to achieve, where you want to go. Um, so I think that was a huge part of it because, you know, this myth of like, uh, I, I, you know, this is it, right? Like it's, it's almost like when bankruptcy hits, it's over and there's no, it's like a black hole. And then after that, there is just nothing after that. So, so your identity is very caught up in your business. And so that's a very sort of, I think that's a huge part of that, which prevents people from even contemplating uh, the idea of insolvency or bankruptcy. And so throwing everything in the kitchen sink at something to avoid that situation happening. Um, it's, uh, I, I like to sort of throw uh, for, for people the idea of, you know, if you had 50K, 50,000 bucks to be able to put on the table into your company, would you do it? You know, that's the first question that comes into play. And if the answer is, you don't think that's a very good use of your money, then that's a clue, right? And it's, but it's not a clue that you're ready for bankruptcy not yet. It's sort of the first step. So that's a huge first myth. And we'll cover some of that as we go through here. A um, couple others. One is, you know, if I'm, uh, I think there's, a, I always had a feeling like if I got, too far behind on payments, you know, a few payments away, I'm like one step away from being pushed into bankruptcy. 
right? Like there would be someone there that would say, you know, that I was always managing this process where I felt like I was just that far away from someone pressing a magical button that would say, that's it, you're done. And um, uh, the reality is it's a long process and, and, you know, and bankruptcy is an expensive process too, which works on both sides. You know, it's not something anybody wants to deal with, which, which, which means there's a lot more room there to be able to sort this out and solve it. Um, and you're not simply just at the whim of one person deciding that this is it and it's over. Um, the other thing is more of a, I, I suppose on a personal note, you know, you have this feeling of um, if I go bankrupt, I'm going to be persona non grata, right? That's, you know, everyone, uh, everybody, my creditors, my employees, my everybody is going to turn against me. Um, there's a bit of a cone of shame here associated with that. Um, and I think one of the things I'll say that through the process we went to um, was I was very, very surprised. It, it's sort of, uh, you know, when you hit a crisis, sometimes you find out who your real friends are. And I think I discovered through this process that 90% of the people, you know, affected by this um, said, you know, Dave, I'm sorry that you're going through this, or, you know, how can I help? Or, you know, there was, it was just, you know, I tried to act with a lot of integrity and honesty and communications. I went through it and I found that was reciprocated. So, you know, bankruptcy is not, you're not going down in, 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 in history as this person that did this terrible thing and didn't meet your obligations to all these people. That's, that's a real stigma that's there, part of it. So um, having been through that process, I've come to realize, you know, it's not all relationships are going to get preserved through this, but the vast majority surprisingly will if you act with integrity through the process. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate that. Um, Frazier, I'll, I'll ask you the same question and only because it's a, a bit of a different lens when it comes to myths. I mean, you do represent um, one of Ottawa's, if not Ottawa's largest um, managers of uh, real estate in, uh, in the region. Uh, what are some of the myths that, that, that you know about or you hear about from your tenants as, as they're exploring these options with, with Colony Bridgeport? I'm, I'm going to say we are the biggest one, just just for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, clients got it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a hard question for me to answer, just because as I get into it, there, you know, we're kind of at the the end with a lot of these tenants, or getting closer to the end with a lot of these tenants. I, I mean, I would say on on the landlord side, if there are any landlords out there, some of the myths or things to be careful of is. But the things we're talking about between insolvency, bankruptcy, and even, you know, when landlords get into distraining or looking at terminating leases, they're all very different things. So, and they all come with different aspects and, and different rights in favor of the landlord. And I'm sure Ted could go on for a long time about all these different things. So it's definitely something to be cautious of, but I mean... As Dave said, I think nobody wants to see tenants go bankrupt and certainly landlords don't want to see their tenants go bankrupt. We don't want to see turnover in our space. So, you know, if anybody out there believes my landlord's out to get me, no, they're often they're a small business as well. And, and they're just looking to, you know, the way they pay their bills is tenants pay their bills. So they're willing to work with their tenants as best as they can and as much as they can to, to make sure that they have a viable center for us, for me, especially our shopping or strip shopping centers. We've want to make sure that we have a good mix of tenants and we want to work with them and not see that turnover. So I think that's probably the biggest myth is if people want, those who want to work with the landlords, I think the landlords are more than willing to work with them. Okay, wonderful. Margo, I'm thinking about calling an audible here because we're 20 minutes into our, our event and we're still on the, really the first question after the introductions. So we'll keep we, moving along. <laughs> well, I was, wondering, I was wondering if you wanted to, to hit up the next question and sure. then the request of Ted and Chantal is if there's a myth in there that you want to talk about, maybe you can mention it at that time. But why don't we move on to question two? That sounds um, good. Just because we have a lot of content. We have a lot and we want to through. make sure yeah. we cover ground. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no. So um, just sort of um, speaking of myths, and this leads into the next question, and I'll lead with you, Chantal. Uh, you know, I think people think about, well, what am I going to lose? You know, what will I keep if I actually file for bankruptcy? What does it mean for me personally? Mm -hmm. Well, it, the answer is different depending on if you're an 
an incorporation or if you're not. So the answer is different for a sole proprietor than it would be for a corporation. So again, if we're talking about the full on bankruptcy, which is, you know, as Dave said, the, the end of a process, um, then assets that would not be protected, uh, that, that there are no assets that are protected for a corporation. Uh, the, in all intent and purposes, the, if you're talking about bankruptcy, the corporation ends and then the trustee steps into the debtor's shoes and then we liquidate assets and then we talk to CRA depending on you know, what debts exist, et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting into the minutia of things, but for a corporation, it's different. For an individual or a sole proprietor, um, you can continue operating and that's often a, a fear of filing for bankruptcy for a sole proprietor is that I don't want to lose my income. I mean, essentially they've created their own job. Um, so for a sole proprietor, what the assets they get to keep is, I'm going to run through this list. So tools and instruments of trade up to a value of uh, $11,300. And that's resale value, not new value. Um, they keep their RSPs, they keep their pension plan. If they had a pension plan from a previous job, they keep that, they don't lose that at all. Um, they also don't necessarily lose any fully encumbered assets. So let's say you have a house and it's fully mortgaged or a car and it's a lease or it's, um, it's, uh, it's fully encumbered, um, then it would have no value for the unsecured creditors, which means that trustee can't sell it, make a profit, and then use the funds to pay off the creditors. So in those instances, the debtors get to keep those assets if they want to keep them. They can also get rid of them within the, the process if at one point some of their secured debt is too heavy. Um, and they also get to keep any vehicle, which is free and clear, that is worth less than $6,600. Um, there's also a home exemption for assets of $10,000 um, of personal assets, stuff you find in the home. And again, that's garage sale value. Um, household furniture, personal effects, essentially. And then there's also, so th that is what you get to keep if you file for, for, for bankruptcy. But again, as Dave uh, was saying, when we're meeting with, with a debtor, we'll always that, ask them, where do you want to go? I mean, if they're talking about, you know, I'm sick and tired of this, I don't see light at the end of the tunnel, I want to, you know, pull the plug and file for bankruptcy, that's essentially what would happen in terms of assets. But if they were ever to, to tell me, well, it's just that I'm insolvent right now. So being insolvent means you can't pay your debts as they become due. So, but I feel that I need to restructure and I wanna keep this business going. Then we're not talking about a bankruptcy. We could be talking about a proposal or restructuring. So those are, are, are things that a licensed insolvency trustee will look at. And we'll also look at, well, do you wanna put any of your personal money into it? And again, there are smart, some smart choices in terms of per, putting personal assets and there are some bad choice. And I'm gonna take the examples of RSPs and our ESPs. If some, sometimes a lot of people will have, you know, RESPs for the kids' education, they don't wanna to touch that because in their mind, that's their kids. So they'll liquidate RSPs. But if the big B ever comes, so if somebody ever, if you ever file for personal bankruptcy, RSPs are protected under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act unless you've dumped money in your RSPs in the year prior to filing for bankruptcy. So unless you've done that, then RSPs are protected. Our ESPs are not because you can go ahead and cash them. They're not a true trust to your child. So you'll lose the government portion, but you can always cash in on your RESPs. So again, when it comes to liquidating assets, I think it's important to consult either a lawyer or a licensed insolvency trustee. And also you have to look at how you're going to restructure your, uh, you know, what do you want to do? What's your end game? Do you want to pull the plug and start over? Or do you want to keep this going? And then those are things that we can help with. Perfect. Thank you, Chantal. That's really great.
Um, Ted, I'm going to flip the question over to you as well, just in speaking from uh, the legal side and just understanding that. And maybe there's a blend in there of talking about what the role the lawyer can play um, through the process, but maybe even before. Yeah. Uh, so when a client comes to see us, so first of all, from my perspective, it's really, really beneficial and important for somebody who is contemplating insolvency to see a lawyer uh, with the greatest of respect for Chantel. Uh, a, a, an insolvency trustee is not the uh, accountable to the bankrupt only. Uh, the uh, insolvency trustees owes a duty to the court, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, their job is to maximize value of assets for the benefit of the creditors. So in the end, they, they, the trustee is there to uh, take the assets of the bankrupt and liquidate it for the benefit of the creditors, not to protect the bankrupt or the bankrupt's assets. That's the job of the lawyer. So if a client can come and see a lawyer first, then we are in a position of being able to talk about the insolvency process from, from the bankrupt's own perspective. What's going to happen to your house? What's going to happen to your assets? How can we keep the business going? So, so we we you know what what debts have you guaranteed? If if it's an incorporated company, what uh, what debts have you guaranteed? What are you personally liable to in terms of government debt and that sort of thing? And I we can explore all of that. We can also talk about assets um, that have been transferred uh, by the debtor to somebody else and the risks that there may be that a trustee may want to come after some of those assets. So we provide valuable advice to uh, somebody who is contemplating insolvency to protect them. That's our job. Our job is to give advice to the bankrupt, to, to support them, to protect them, to help them to be as ready as possible for the process. We also talk about alternatives. So it can be everything from simply shutting the doors. Once we have an idea as to what the potential risks of liability are, liabilities are, sometimes the best, easiest, and cheapest thing to do is simply to shut the doors of the business. Uh, next possibility is uh, to look for ways of injecting cash into the business, as Chantel has mentioned, uh, and thereby finding uh, ways of, of, of creative financing, sometimes even from the creditors themselves, in order to be able to keep the business going. Uh, next possibility is what we would call an informal proposal, where you go to uh, creditors and the, particularly those who are, who are um, uh, putting a lot of pressure in the business and try to negotiate. Uh, sometimes it's just forbearance, just get them to hold off for a bit while we try to put the business back in the right track. And sometimes we're actually looking at compromising the debt, explain to the creditor that the alternative would see them get even less money than if we can keep the business going and pay them over time. Next, uh, next possibility, and I'm just going, trying to do this in linear order that we would consider next is an actual formal proposal process. The advantage of a formal proposal process is you actually stop the creditors from being able to take action against you while you put together a proposal to submit to the creditors for acceptance. And uh, Chantal and I work together on all kinds of files where uh, I'm referring the client to Chantal to do a formal proposal process because of the threats of secured or other creditors who are gonna take action against the assets of the debtor. And we are in a position where uh, Chantal can actually file a document called a notice of intention to proposal uh, which to file a proposal which stops all the creditors from doing what they could do. Uh, what they could otherwise do to seize assets. And then finally, the, the last step would be bankruptcy itself. So a huge range of choices, huge range of possibilities. And we're in a great position to be able to, to give a client advice about what the choices are. Ultimately, uh, you, the, the, the person facing uh, the insolvency, know your business better than we do, but we know the process and we can help to fit the process within your business to figure out what the best solution is. And again, always, uh, as much as I say that the trustee is not there to support um, the, the, the advice that we would give to a, a, an insolvent person, ultimately, they're, they're a very important follow-up step if we have to go down a formal road. That's great, Ted. Thank you very much. So, and that's a, 
brilliant segue into the, the the next question, which of course were the you know the alternatives you talked about uh, cash infusion uh, into the business, shutting the doors, informal formal proposal. Uh, I'll open that up to the, the the general panel now, Dave, Chantel, and Fraser. Do you have anything to add as it relates to alternatives uh, to bankruptcy, just for the the benefit of our listeners? Is there anything more to add? Well, Ted kind of did you know the list. Um, so I think, uh, that, that has been covered. Um, but again, I think that it's important for the, the officers of a corporation or the debtor or the shareholders to figure out what their end game, what they want their end game to be and how they're going to get there. Um, if you're talking about restructuring, filing a proposal, okay, well, you can rearrange your debt load. Um, in order to make uh, a proposal to your creditors, which means you're not paying everybody 100 cents on the dollar. You might be, you know, pen, paying some creditors 100 cents on the dollar, like the secured creditors or uh, source deductions, uh, which you would have to, but you would also could restructure your unsecured debt. Um, at, you know, X cents on the dollar, but you can all, what I, my best advice is not just to rely on the debt restructuring. You also have to look at internally, what changes do you have to make in order to make your business viable? Um, within the process, we, you know, we help as, as Ted said, you know, he made me look like the, the evil, you know, bankruptcy oh. trustee, <laughs> but we're there to administer a process and we, he's right. We are there to represent everybody, the courts, the creditors, the debtors, unlike a lawyer, we do not represent legally the debtors, but we're there to give sound advice as well, but in need, you know, equitable advice and the bankruptcy and insolvency act is built on the premise that allows a debtor to have a fresh start and it uh, 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 the we have the obligations to ensure that the creditors have a fair and reasonable outcome as well. So while you're restructuring, you have to look at what you need to do. And I find that some officers or of a corporation, that is what they have difficulties with is what do they have to change internally? Does that mean restructuring? Does that mean getting rid of some staff? getting rid of some staff that you actually like as people? Um, does that mean that you have to restructure your process? Does that mean that you have to move uh, selling platforms? You know, how you do business and the pandemic has certainly forced a lot of, especially retail and restaurants. They went to like, you know, they've read the ones that have succeeded have, have been able to adapt. So how are you going? So a lot of people are like set in their ways. So I think it's important to look at, you know, what, what, what do you, where do you want to go? What's your end game and how am I going to get there? And it's not solely the lawyer, the licensed insolvency trustee and, you know, the landlord it's, you know, internally as well. And I find that often that is the big piece that is missing when when, you know, if you're trying to have success in restructuring within a proposal, you know, you can bring a horse to water, we can tell people, you know, you need to look at this, we need to look at that, but if people won't, they won't. But, you know, so people are, are often, um, they, they, a lot of people are successful in restructuring, and those that are, are the ones that were not afraid to look at themselves internally and look at, you know, what do I need to change in order to make my business viable in the future while restructuring a debt within a proposal? Sounds an awful lot like Dave's comment earlier um, around mental health, yeah. right? Having the ability to look inside uh, it, it's so vitally important to the process. It's not just the external factors. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. yeah. Actually, do you mind? I just really quickly, where I know we're trying to move along here, but I think it's such an important element to this, to what Chantal said there. There is, uh, you know, when I went through this process, it was the first step was, was recognizing, and the way I'll put it is, the company as it is currently structured is not viable. Okay, it doesn't mean bankrupt, but as it is currently structured is not viable. And that's a very different thing. And that leaves a lot of possibilities. But, but part of the first steps I took there was that first 
I think it was a good week after I made that recognition. Okay. So I said, whoa, and that was sort of that, oh, you know, the oh shit moment, so to speak. And I was just like, what's going on? But I pulled back to be able to say, okay, I, 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 but here's what happened is I had this freedom for the first time in 17 years to say, what do you want to do with the rest of your life, Dave? Like what, what now? Like I'm not bound by this is it. Um, and I got to sort of think about that and actually take a moment to be able to say, this is what I want to do. And that happened to be a portion of what my old business was doing, but not all of it. And so then I was able to start from the beginning and say, okay, forget whatever I've done in the past in order for this new business to be viable. This is what needs to be in place. So that allowed me then to wear two hats, right? So I had my director hat then of the old company that had responsibilities and obligations for dealing with that situation. But my second hat could go about creating this new thing and figure out the process with lawyers and trustees ultimately to figure out how to get from A to B. So I think it's kind of, you, you gotta wear the two hats and be very conscious and intentional about those two processes because they're very, very different what's going on in both of those, those realms. A, a lot of the bigger businesses, um, and I'm talking about, you know, if, if you remember pre-pandemic, uh, the retail space was already falling. A lot of, you know, clothing stores were, were restructuring. They filed under the CCAA, which is the Company Creditors Arrangement Act. And those, and they all have at least $5 million worth of debt, if not more. And a lot of them have a, have created a new role. And that's something that we see in big files. It's a chief restructuring officer. So basically, if the business is big enough, so when Dave is talking about wearing those two hats, at one point you do have to have, or somebody has to wear the hat of chief restructuring officer without losing the values that you want to continue with the, with the business. Right. That's a really great point, Chantal. And I think, in, like, I mean, for the, a lot of the businesses that, uh, that we're connecting with and, and, uh, and so on, they're small businesses. And, and so unfortunately it becomes, yeah, and I think Dave, this is what you described as your experience. It becomes another one of those hats that come onto the head of the owner CEO. And, and, and that straddling those two sides must be very difficult, you know, because you are dealing with employees. You're dealing with, like you say, your personal sense of feeling you've got obligations, but yet you need that, that person who can have that. And uh, I just wondered if you had any comments on that, Dave. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it is, uh, it, that's where the real challenge of this process comes because there are so many people you're interacting with um, and dealing with on this front. But I'll say this, I, I think there's unbelievable clarity that starts to come into play once you recognize that right here, right now, I'm wearing my old company's hat as a director and I have an obligation to be able to deal with this situation. And I, and I could literally feel that change happen. And over here is my other hat, right? And so, and so the mindset and the conversations were in one hand, you know, one was, okay, this is, this is ending and we don't know quite know where all the pieces are coming, but, but this has to end. And that, that's a hard conversation, but it's got to happen. And those, and, the, and you're managing that process, but it, it just, for, I, I think for everybody that brings clarity, right? Because there's a lot of clarity about this is this this business is insolvent. It's not really going to be viable in the long run. Um, and meanwhile, on the other side of it, you can go and have those creative, you know, we're creating and building something great over here conversations because that's very real. And actually, it was a bit for me. Um, uh, it, it it was freeing in the sense that I still had the opportunity to create outside of this something new and, and kind of gave me the, the energy, I'll say, to be able to, to bring this to close. It's almost like become a project manager about bringing this process to a closure to whatever outcome you need that to happen. But it, but it really, um, it surprised me how much just making that key decision and then dividing those pieces out made me way more effective actually on both sides of that compared to where I was before, which was just chasing and trying to try, try to manage it all. Um, it actually got things better, funny enough, I think. Great, thanks Dave. Um, just, um, I know when we look at our, we've got a lot of questions and we're covering a lot of ground, so we might kind of move along to some different areas, but maybe just, um, and I'll start with you, Fraser, if you just sort of think back, you know, when you think of a tenant you had um, who was in trouble or anybody's experiences, like what would you think is one of the biggest lessons learned that you wish to have shared with them? 
I think the biggest thing is to know your options. A lot of people, especially when it comes to real estate, and I'm going to focus on the retail side for this question, but, you know, people who build a business and they think, well, my business has been here for 15 or 20 years, and this is my space, and this is where people know where to find me. People's mindsets have changed. They, you know, they can find you online. There's a lot of different ways to find you. So, you know, as much as locking yourself into a five or a 10 year lease, you still have options. So if you reach a point where the space isn't working for you, then, you know, reach out to Warren or some, you know, a, a broker or somebody to kind of understand what your options are, because there are ways to sublet your space, you can assign your lease, like there are ways to, and I'm going to use that famous word that everyone loves to use, pivot, when your business is changing, your space maybe needs to change too. And, you know, Chantal said it best, like it's sometimes tough to look at the business that you've built, you've built and the people that you employ and have to let some of those go. And I think a lot of people struggle with that in terms of their space as well. It's great when you're growing your space and it's, you know, new and shiny and, and so on, but there are times where you have to contract that and, you know, change the way that you you market the, the way that you advertise, the way that you're displaying merchandise. And, and that's where you have to kind of sometimes focus in on and, and look in the mirror or look at your space and say, is this actually the most productive way to do what I want to do? Because there's a cost for the space that you're standing in. And especially on the retail side, that selling floor is a fairly high cost. So you got to make sure that it's producing what you need it to produce. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. And it might be time to look at something else. Great. That, that's great, Fraser. I remember two years ago when we were part of the Ottawa Real Estate Forum, uh, we were chatting a lot about how retail users need to reposition their space, not just for the experience of the consumer going into it, but how do they utilize the back area better to service some of those online orders as they fulfill the, the obligations under their lease. For um, sure. Yeah. So it's that, I, it's that creative thinking. And we're actually seeing a lot more tenants Warren coming out looking for smaller space and you know potentially looking at the warehousing market and we all well you and I both know that the warehousing market is very tight right now but you know there's definitely those out there that are saying do I need all this back of house space for storage that I'm paying premium rents on or can I find a different way to do it and there's lots of new storage options out there we all see the four five six story storage units going up so like there's many different ways that companies can look at changing the way they do their business and, and, you know, how they deal with the people from an online perspective and get the product into people's hands faster. And it may not always be your typical retail space. Mm -hmm. So Anybody else have a, you want to move along? Yep. Sorry. I, I was going to say along those lines, I, I want to get kind of Ted uh, back into the conversation here really quickly because um, I know that I, I know well, quite frankly, Ted, you're I think you're a, a tenant of Colonnade Bridgeport. So uh, God, maybe God this forbid, is... yes. No, I have nothing but good things to He's say. He's our best tenant, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I got I got paid to say he was our best tenant. That's good. That's <laughs> yes. We had a little discussion before we got online this morning. So, um, from your perspective, do you have anything to add? And, and most importantly, you know, given given that you're one of the the earlier conversations that uh, a user, a tenant, and and, a, and an entrepreneur and an owner of the business itself uh, should have, when when should they start engaging with their landlord? And again, anything to add to Fraser's comment, and that would be a kind of the follow up question. I find, for the most part, it's a good idea to engage with the landlord early in the process. Um, it depends on the landlord, of course, because you have uh, sometimes you have quite acrimonious relations between a landlord and tenant, and then it becomes a very defensive process of trying to protect your client. In that regard, I will say that uh, you know prior to insolvency, um, basically all the rights uh, rest with the landlord uh, upon any kind of default that the landlord can terminate the lease at any time, lock the doors, take possession, relet, and hold you responsible for damages. If you, if, if, the, if you put your company into bankruptcy, however, all of a sudden the trustee becomes in charge of the lease and they have some control over possession and when, if, if and when to give possession back to the landlord. In many cases, there's a lot of value in the location because there've been a lot of leasehold improvements 
uh, and the location is an important factor in, in particularly in the re retail industry. Uh, and so it may be very important where there's a risk or where there is uh, an arrears of rent to consider moving straight into either a proposal or bankruptcy situation so you can preserve the relation, you can preserve the tenancy as long as you need to. Uh, and uh, and so, so that's the, the, the aspect from the rights of it. But, uh, you know, the, I talked about uh, informal uh, approaches to creditors. And usually one of the biggest uh, potential creditors is the landlord. Uh, and, uh, you know, Fraser is absolutely right that, that landlords tend not to want to have to deal with empty space. Uh, and they will usually work hard to help you see, go through hard times and their fingers in the pulse, they have, they particularly a, a large landlord like Colony Bridgeport will appreciate the economics uh, involved in running your business and also the risks. Um, and depending on the relationship you have with them, they may, they may number one, like your business, they may like what it does for the, for the mall or the location that it's in. Um, and they, they, sometimes they tend to be actually nice human beings that want to help out. And, and I, I think it's, so I, I actually think engaging with a landlord early, for the most part, is, is the right way uh, to go because they, they do want to see you continue. And if you're, and you, 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 you want to be careful about the, if you are able to reach a deal with them, you want to be careful of what that deal is going to be. Um, because if you personally, if let's say you have a company, which is the, the, the tenant, uh, and you personally guaranteed the lease and the landlord says, well, you know, we won't collect rent for a few months. We'll just let the arrears build. Well, of course, you're building up your own personal liability for it. So that's where getting a bit of advice from us while you're negotiating with the landlord uh, is a good idea. And I've, I've been in that position a number of occasions uh, assisting with negotiations with the landlord to try to, 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 to respect the landlord's desire to keep uh, my client in the premises at the same time as trying to get a, a, you know, a break that makes sense for both sides. I, I like Ted's use of the word sometimes in that part of the conversation. Well, when he <laughs> references the landlord, but I I'll just jump in quickly, Warren, I, I totally agree with Ted. And I think that's something people need to think about too is, is know, know your lease, but know it before you sign it. It, you know, there is, there is a default clause in your lease and it may put you to sleep if you try and read it, but I guarantee you someone like Ted can explain to you what it means. And when you get a default notice from your landlord, know what that means, because then that the landlord is ultimately securing their rights to a certain degree. And, and then the clock starts ticking and whether or not they execute further to that is ultimately up to the landlord, but it's best to know what you're in for and absolutely start to potentially have those conversations earlier because often, the landlord doesn't want to go down that road any further, especially if a tenant is being communicative to the landlord. Maybe uh, just um, make sure I'm not on mute there. I'm not. Um, just sort of um, touching on this, and we're kind of still in the section of headspace, and we'll get into some more facts area as well. Um, and I'm going a bit off script here, but I think going back to that notion of knowing it ahead, you know, as an entrepreneur myself, and, you know, Dave, I know you would have uh, had this as well. I mean, some of those biggest fears uh, really get personal, right? It's about your family. Um, it's about your home. It's your security that, you know, and maybe your family and friends have invested in your business and, and just try to understand, um, you know, I think that that becomes a very, very weighty, heavy burden for entrepreneurs and possibly something that really um, drags them into a really difficult headspace. Um, and so I am just kind of wondering what can be done, you know, ahead of time to sort of mitigate some of those risks. How do you protect some of those things uh, in terms of, you know, whether it's family investments and maybe you can't, I don't know, or your, your personal assets. And so I don't know if that's something um, maybe I'd like, I definitely would like everybody to weigh in on it, but Dave, I'm just interested in your headspace going through it where, where you were at. Yeah, it's, I mean, all of the above, right? So those, certainly all of those issues come to play. Um, obviously uh, the, the more upfront in terms of, you know, you talk about something like family investments or so on. I mean, having in place security, you know, obviously is a big part of that to ensure you can protect. So, so there, so upfront, there is a bunch of work that can be done. Um, I think, you know, even, 
if this is going to be a long process, it, this is if someone's not quite sure, and even now, right? That, that that if they're feeling like they might be vulnerable, and maybe maybe that reality doesn't actually hit for several years out, then then dealing with it now can be some things to be done. That's why I think it's it's sort of uh, the sooner you. I think one of the big things here in all of this is the sooner you recognize, right, that this company might not be viable in the long run, the better it is going to be for everyone because. Um, even if it's, if it's, you know, you, you might even be paying all your debts, paying everybody off, doing what you're supposed to, but you're not paying yourself, for instance, right? That's very common with entrepreneurs. Who's the first person to get cut? Me. So, so, you know, that, that could be a situation where you're paying everybody else, but you're not paying yourself. And so in fact, your company is not really viable because you're investing your time for free. So, you know, there, there can, but those are the reason I just mentioned that is because the sooner you can kind of recognize that this company might not really work out in the long run, the sooner you can put in place some of those things to protect it. And that comes to then that first conversation is that with not just your, your regular lawyer, but really in a bankruptcy lawyer, right? People who know what the bankruptcy process, it's, it's the part we don't want to know about, but we need to know about it and recognize that in the worst case, what's going to happen here when, if it, or worst case, if that's the appropriate case at some point, then what does that mean? And then you can work your way back. And this comes into this role of like managing the process so that you can at the earliest stage possible put in place the mechanisms to protect yourself and your, your family or, or whoever might be that's, that's impacted by this. So, uh, um, you know, that's there's a lot that can be done there once you get to that point. I, I wouldn't mind. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Ted, tell me a little bit more of what you think about that in terms of how you protect it. So if, if for, I just want to address the mental health issue. First of all, I find when, when someone comes into my office, the first thing I want to try to restore is their dignity. Um, because and, and I think uh, clients don't appreciate uh, or in people who are potentially insolvent don't appreciate the incredible pressure and stress that they have lived with for months, sometimes years in trying to keep their business going, mm -hmm. that is all of a sudden gone when they get into that insolvency process. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they have secretly been feeling badly and increasingly badly about themselves because they're not able to keep this thing going. And, uh, it, it, you know, it, I, it, I, what I say to, to clients is we don't have debtor's prison anymore. You don't go to jail because you can't pay your debts. So, so let, let's get over ourselves. Don't, you know, get rid of that guilt because this is a legitimate legal process to go through if you can't manage your debts. Uh, and, um, but, but we, so I'll give you a couple of examples uh, of, of where we, our advice can be helpful at early stages. One is discussing personal liabilities. So in addition to debts for which uh, a business uh, owner has provided guarantee, you have government debt, HST and employee deductions, which are debts for which a director is personally liable. So uh, my focus in talking with clients is about making sure that they keep uh, HST and employee deductions up to date when they're, when they're starting to run short of cash. The problem is, and of course the pandemic, uh, God love the uh, federal government that said, okay, we're gonna give you a break in the timing to pay your employee deductions in HST. They know they're gonna get it at the end of the day anyway, because you are personally as a director on the hook for those debts. So it, it, it was not, frankly, a very uh, a considerate thing to do from the, from the government's perspective, ultimately. If they said, we're going to forgive your HST and employee deduction payments, that would be one thing, but that's definitely uh, not what they did. That never, ever, ever happens. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and uh, you know, Chantal and I have traded stories and worked together on files where we've had to deal with CRA, and they're probably, uh, in my experience, the worst creditor to have to deal with. They are the, the, the least compromising and the most exacting in the process. So you don't, you, if you can help it, you don't want to owe HST or, or source deductions. You just, you want to keep those debt. Secondly, there are remedies available to a trustee who wants to try to increase the pot of assets to go back and challenge transactions that a debtor has engaged in. Uh, transfer of property to a spouse, um, a preference payment to a creditor that's a relative, that sort of thing. My job pre-bankruptcy is to talk to a client about the risks, what a trustee in a bankruptcy can later do to challenge these uh, 
uh, these potential transactions that you're either considering or have undertaken. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, forewarned is forearmed. Uh, and a client with that information can choose the timing of their insolvency, if you will, or also reframe uh, a potential transaction so that it's a legitimate transaction from the, stamp, from the uh, perspective of the trustee looking at it later on. Great. Well, Chantel, I, did you have something to add on that? Yeah, uh, a lot of the, I, uh, most debtors or officers that I see will not have sought the advice of a lawyer or an insolvency lawyer. And the main reason is because it costs money. Um, but, you know, there's an expression in English, you can't be like, you know, penny wise, dollar foolish or something like that. And, and I think that's a perfect uh, example, um, because a lawyer can help with some prep that the, the, the trustee can't. I mean, once we have a file in front of us, we can find solutions to a bunch of problems that we see, but we cannot help somebody prepare for the insolvency process. So it, it might be worth the few thousand dollars that you're spending, you might save it. And when the insolvency process is done well, whether it's through a bankruptcy where somebody is, you know, flipped and gone through a fresh start, or whether it's a proposal and they've successfully, you know, restructured by the time we have a proposal is in place and, you know, payments are being made. The one of the things that I hear uh, the most is, man, can I sleep better now? Um, and that always comes, you know, after we've, you know, done, done the deep dive into where they're going and what they're doing, it takes a while to get there, but you have to get there and you have to get there. there there's a lot of steps as Dave and, and Ted have explained. Thanks. Or I'll let Very you quickly, Margo, can yeah. I just say that I, I, as being that entrepreneur who faced that decision and, and about... I am very, very grateful that I spent the money I needed to to get the right advice. Right? I mean, it it's, it it paid itself in 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 so much, not just in sleep at night, but uh, I mean, financially, it was the right thing to do. So, I just want to echo that. That's not just that someone who might not otherwise have done, it, but in this case, I I did do what the really follow the advice of, of the legal side of it and did things and and spent the money I needed to to do there, even though it was hard to find but uh, zero regrets on doing that. I think it's one of the most important steps someone needs to take in this. Chantel, I remember when I was a young man, my mom said it was penny wise, pound foolish. That's it. I have no idea what a pound was until I started to travel. Uh, <laughs> but you're right, it's, it, it's, it's important to make sure that you don't lose sight of what's really important. So we've spent a lot of time on kind of the headspace and it's bled into the process and it's bled into the facts. And what I'm trying to say politely is it's absolutely blown up all of our questions because I'm pretty certain that so much, I'm going through them and my eyes are coming up and down the page here. But I think maybe Chantel, if I could ask you to spend a little bit more time on something you touched on earlier. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need to go through the list of the things that you get to keep and the things that you get to, to, to that you don't get to keep. So Margo, I'm stealing question 13 from you and, and kind of asking Chantel, could you spend a little bit more time on you know, the, the, you know, the liabilities of um, you know, the director of a corporation and what they're, you know, I mean, are they liable for the corporate debts uh, in a bankruptcy? And then when you're finished, we'll, we'll, we'll pass it over to Ted because I'm sure he's got a little bit of information on that as well. So could you, uh, could you kind of shed some light on that just for our audience to understand if they're a sole proprietor or, or director of a corporation? Yeah, um, the easy answer and the simple answer is is a corporate is a director or officer of a corporation liable for any of the corporation's debt. The answer is no, unless unless it unless it is some of the following. Personally, if they've personally guaranteed some debt, so if they've co-signed the line of credit. Um, a lot of corporate credit cards, people don't realize this, but when you're at the bank, they'll give you a corporate credit card and there's actually a little line where you're actually co-signing personally for that, you know, Royal Visa uh, corporate card. Um, a lot of people, when people establish their business, you know, these things aren't a problem un until they're a problem. So that's a lot of, th that's what we see. And then there's government debt. Some government that debt um, they're liable for. First of all, there's GST, HST, PST, depending on, you know, what your obligations are. 
the that is an unsecured debt to a corporation, um, which means that they rank along with all the trades and whatever when you're filing a proposal. But the officer or the director of the operation is personally liable for 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 those funds. Um, and could be held liable. Um, and uh, it, 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 again, that is something that a lawyer would do if you, I'm assuming that if somebody were to consult with Ted prior to this process, at one point, if you have a choice between, you know, paying down a supplier or paying down the HST, logically it's paying down whatever you're personally liable for. Um, and then there's also unpaid salaries to employee, which an officer could be held liable for, um, payroll deductions as well. Um, so any funds that you've clawed back to your, to your from your employees and have not remitted, plus penalties, plus interest. And that's where the debts really accrue. And some people, when they come see me, they're like, yeah, but the debt was only for like, you know, $10,000 and now I owe 57. So I want to make them an offer for $10,000. But when we're negotiating a proposal with CRA, the CRA person will tell you, no, you know, what we have here as a liability is 50,000, regardless of what the original amount was for. So as these debts accrue, they become a reality um, for, uh, for, for, um, for CRA. And they're very hard to, we can negotiate terms within a proposal. Um, but again, that, that, that's all up to discussions. They'll look at what you have in terms of assets, personal assets, if you're personally liable for, even though they might not have anything to do with the uh, corporation's assets. Um, and you're also personal. Uh, and again, um, as um, Fraser will tell you, a lot of people understand your lease. Did you personally co-sign the lease? That it, it, it is, it's astounding to me, the number of people I ask them, you know, I'm going through their list of liabilities or okay, I'm late with rent for two months. Okay, did, did you personally co-sign the lease? Oh, I don't know. Okay, do you have a copy of your lease? Uh, I'll have to find that. Okay, so let me help you find that. You know, when you signed the lease, did you get a copy? Uh, I think I did. Okay, what'd you do with it? So it's, you know, so again, it's these things aren't a problem until they're a problem. Again, I'm kind of, you know, caricaturizing what happens in my office, but it often happens. So know your lease, know what you're personally liable for. Um, and apart from that, you're not, unless you've personally co-signed, you're not liable for any trades. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, any suppliers, uh, any, you know, leases you would not have personally co-signed. Um, and, and a lot of people, what they ask me is like, well, wh wh why did my lawyer tell me to incorporate if I'm responsible for all of this? It's like, well, I don't know. Um, so again, <laughs> that's a question for your lawyer. You know, I'm here to fix the future. Lamp, lamp, lampooned yet again. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, what, so, were you, um, what were you doing? <laughs> I tell you, God yeah. knows. I, yeah. I just wanted I just wanted to add uh, to Chantel's list. Uh, it, it, it's she's absolutely right with leases. People sign them without knowing what they're signing, and the number of people who've told me no, I did not personally sign, and they have because I never looked. You know, it was a bunch of papers, and they they often didn't seek legal advice before signing their lease. They just signed it. So they have no idea what they sign, no idea what the terms are, no idea what their personal obligations are. But it's not just leases is one thing, but I had a client who signed, uh, he, he was, you know, I gave him some advice, asked him if he personally guaranteed any of his debts, any of, any of the obligations of the company. He said, absolutely not. <laughs> and about two weeks after he assigned himself into bankruptcy, he received a letter from the, the, the inventory supplier. Uh, making a personal demand for $86,000 from him. And, uh, and they sent him a copy of the credit application that he had filled out at the time that uh, he applied for, 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 uh, uh, for the supply. And, uh, you know, little tiny words in the back of the form, which said, I hereby personally guarantee the debt sold by my company and his signature followed. Uh, and he was therefore personally liable for $86,000. Uh, and of course, he was mad at everybody in the world except himself, but he's the one that signed it. 
So I, I, you know, one of my processes is to grill clients about, are you sure you have not personally signed on something or that you've given me the list of everything there is? Because because it's impossible to give advice to somebody um, who is operating in a corporate business unless you know the extent of that personal exposure to risk. So Chantal brings up a very good point that I'm just going to jump in on here. So it's... It is somewhat astounding sometimes the number of tenants when you go to talk to them about a renewal or or they'll even they're looking to assign their lease and they'll actually reach out to us and say can i get a copy of my lease so the one thing to remember is yes know your lease when you sign it but also when you look like you can kind of somewhat reset the clock every five or ten years or whatever your lease term is so you know before you just sign a quick renewal because you're busy working on something else or there's a big RFP due or something, you know, dust off the lease and start over. It's worth reading again. It's always worth reading again to know where you're at because things can change in a matter of, certainly in a matter of years. So it's definitely good to know where you're at and engage someone like Ted or a broker, like get somebody else involved if you don't have time to read it. It's, we're going back to penny wise, pound foolish, right? So if, if you don't have time to read it, have somebody else read it and make sure that you understand what your liabilities are going forward before you sign it again. I have a interesting, again, just as an entrepreneur myself and a business owner, um, a few things that I think there's, again, myths about or assumptions that um, business owners make and, and uh, wait on it initially about being incorporated and the view that, well, I'm protected, it's incorporated, I'm separated, that's my protection and relying entirely on that um, as being their protection and not understanding that they are a director and they are still, I guess that corporate veil can be pierced through this process. Um, so I'd like to kind of hear about that. The second thing is the idea of personal guarantees. I don't know any small business, whether it's um, known to them or not, where almost anything they sign where there's some sort of obligation place that it seems a personal guarantee is almost always asked, you know, and, and I'm just interested in people's perspective about you know, to what degree is a small business owner, can you actually push back on those things? You know, and Fraser, I'll ask you as a, you know, a landlord, the idea that, you know, someone's coming in, when can they push back and say, you know what, I'm not prepared to put a personal guarantee? And is there ever any flexibility on these things? Well, and Warren may jump in on this one too, but certainly there's always room to push back. There's always room to negotiate, I would say. Uh, I mean, you know, the landlord's starting position a lot of times with small businesses is, yeah, they look for a personal guarantee, but the thing to understand and whether it's yourself or with the help of somebody else, your accountant or a broker, understand what the landlord is in for too. So, you know, it's great to go out and ask the landlord to provide you, you know, what we call a tenant inducement where the landlord will give you some cash once you've done your fit up or free rent or so on. But the landlord looks at that as risk. So, you know, the more risk the landlord's taking on, the more they're going to want personal guarantees, depending on the company and the, um, you know, the financials that are provided. So understand the landlord's risk yeah. to understand your risk as well going into it to, and, you know, try and make sure that there's some evenness to it there. Right. You know, level okay. the playing field. You, you, you can certainly look at leveling the playing field, but understand that the landlord is definitely taking risk every day so yeah. and our job is to mitigate landlords risk and certainly small businesses need to ensure to mitigate theirs as well mm -hmm. i just want to throw a, a personal guarantee doesn't have to be a blank personal guarantee it can be mm -hmm. limited to amount of money uh it can be limited uh in time mm -hmm. uh and so and so i find that uh i i have been successful um, uh, including with recently with Colonnade Bridgeport uh, in negotiating uh, a limited guarantee uh, mm -hmm. because the a landlord will see their risk as, as uh, Fraser has said, 
um, either that if a company is going to make it, it's going to be in the first two years. So I want to know that I that that for the next two years, I've got a personal guarantee if if the company fails, um, or they're concerned about uh, the leasehold improvements that they have spent either by or or the free rent, and so they're going to look for a guarantee. And if you have a discussion with the landlord about what their actual risk is in terms of dollars, you can then start negotiating a personal guarantee that is uh, that is that there's it's a lot of money for a client, but at least you then you then have a number on that risk rather, rather than it being an unlimited 10 year uh, uh, liability uh, without end, uh, I might add. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and there's, may... there's lots, there's lots of different ways to mitigate that risk. Like, we're talking a lot about personal guarantees, but you know, there are a lot of people that just don't want to sign a personal guarantee. They just they can't bring themselves to doing that. And and that's when we get into some prepaid rent or a larger security deposit. So there's there's lots of different ways to manage your own risk. It's just determining some level of comfort and to Ted's point, and as I mentioned before, it's understanding what the landlord's risk is going into. Right. So what I'm hearing, uh, Fraser, is that you know a mindset going into this and understanding, even though you're negotiating on your own behalf and your own best interest, is understanding you've got another business on the other side of the table and being very empathetic to okay how do we how do we work together to get to this point and and whether that's putting more up front or perhaps a business has had very strong financials in those you know, that you're able to demonstrate you know you've lowered their risk is what you know I'm hearing um so, well and the, and the thing to remember Margo is there are a lot of small businesses that are landlords out there uh -huh, and they of have they have mortgages and loans that they have personally signed for. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing, just last point, I'll stop talking about personal guarantees. You can tell this is something I've dealt with. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also the banks. I mean, we haven't talked about personal guarantees, but pretty much any operating line or loans and so on, uh, you know, almost inevitably, even under the commercial banking, a lot of times small businesses are still dealing with personal banking. But even under commercial banking, that requirement to put a personal guarantee on that and working with the banks. And I'm just curious, um, Chantal, if that's an, in terms of, of, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, the insolvency process and so on, how does that work the banks and, and how do you, you know, what's the experience people can expect? And maybe Dave wants to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, uh, again, banks are very conservative in terms of lending. Um, they, they, they will most likely either take security on an asset or security or personal guarantee. So it's one or the other. So it really depends if they have a security on an asset, if I'm dealing with it in a bankruptcy scenario, then most often, you know, we, they, they just take back the asset. Either I sell it, sell it for them if I'm selling the business or the assets or they will take their own liquidator, take possession and sell the assets, or they can appoint a receiver to do so. Um, so, I mean, if, if they have an asset, you have to deal with it in isolation. So if we're talking about a proposal, then we have to deal with bank. How, you know, how do you want to treat bank X in terms of this asset? Do you just want to continue paying as per the agreement? Do you want to change the mechanism which you're paying? And then what are what are we offering them in exchange? And what's the value of the asset that they have? You know, how does it compare to their security? So those are all, especially in a proposal scenario, all things that we have to discuss and all things that we use to negotiate with the banks. If they have a personal guarantee, um, and nothing else. Well, then the bank will probably, if we're if we're talking about a corporation and not a sole proprietor, um, then they'll also want to know. Well, if I have a personal guarantee, even though this is the corporation that's filing for a proposal, well, I still want to know what this person has in terms of assets. So, so they will have. Ask for divulge for for the officer or the the cosigner to divulge some of their what they have in terms of assets, um, because they will want to make a business decision in terms of okay, shall should I accept the terms of this proposal? Because you know if this guy ends up putting the corporation into bankruptcy, there's very little that I can take personally, or you know. So, so those are all part of the discussions um, that have to happen. So the, the yeah, and most most 
banks, if we're talking about, you know, the big banks will have, uh, and there's also some high risk lenders in there. Um, high risk lenders are negotiable, but again, their interest and the interest that they charge and the fees that they charge their clients are very, very high. Um, so essentially, those who pay, pay for those who don't. Okay. Um, so it's all um, for from the bank's perspective, it's all risk assessment. Um, and they will want to take an informed decision, um, you know, on the onset of the, of the loan structure and during an insolvency process as well. Does that answer your question? It does for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I just thought, um, I just want to do a very quick check-in with Lynn. Uh, we know that, um, we may or may not get questions from folks. I just want to check in with Lynn. Do we have any yet at this point? We've got tons, so it's no problem, but. Uh, no, continue on with your okay. uh, agenda. Thank you. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Marco, did you want me to speak about that to the personal guarantee side of it? Yes. Yeah, it's <clears throat> certainly. So I think one thing I wanted to be cognizant of as we kind of go through this is um, I don't, uh, I hope for anybody watching this that they don't get scared off by the fact that, oops, I didn't, I didn't check this. I've got these personal guarantees, all these issues. Therefore, I can't go through the bankruptcy process, right? I, I think that's a big risk here that I want to make sure I flag. Um, I think one of the biggest, uh, it was certainly the biggest fear in my mind as I faced all of this was any of those personal obligations of what would this mean for my family, for my home, for, for so on. Um, but, uh, some wise counsels that have told me, A, as I was starting this process the earlier, start it, right? I mean, the reality is if you don't deal with it at this point, the longer you wait, the bigger that problem is going to become if your company is already at an insolvent stage. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is that the, the earlier in the process that someone told me, said, listen, Dave, you know, this is a pretty scary moment right now. I know, but I can almost guarantee you in 12 months from now you, your family, everybody else is going to be in a better place than you are today. That's hard and it's difficult. You're going to face these things head on. Um, but, but that's, but you're at the end of it, you're going to get it dealt with. And that's what this bankruptcy process, if it comes down to that is all about. So, um, I think that's sort of something I want just to reiterate people keep in mind. I think it's, it's again, like all of these things, the earlier you start, the more you can plan. That's sort of the big thing in this too, is whether that's your landlord recognizing, okay, who we got here that we're dealing with that are personal guarantees. And, and not to be able to look at that and then work within the context, obviously, of, of the as a director and your obligations and so on to have there. But the more time you have, the more you, room you have to be able to make this work. There's, there is a lot of control once you understand the boundaries of that. And that starts with that conversation with legal. Yeah, I, yeah, I just wanted to throw something else in here that uh, <laughs> you have a relationship as a borrower with your bank, and it's usually a commercial branch uh, in the city. Uh, there comes a time when there you are uh, either in arrears or the bank is worried about its security that the loan gets sent off to Toronto or London or wherever the uh, what they call the special uh, special debts or special recovery goes. And you're then dealing with somebody who has no idea who you are. They don't really care who you are. They, they're not your friend. They, their sole job is to get as much money as they can. So uh, I find it's important to try to work as long as you can with, with the branch to figure out how to handle the business in the context of, of, of the bank liability. That's again where Chantel can, can come in in the context of, of a proposal where if you have dealt uh, if, if you have dealt with the, um, with the bank in an upfront way, you've got an ability to be able to preserve maximum value for the assets if you have to go through that insolvency process. Because at the end of the, the day, the bank wants to get as much money as possible and you want them to get as much money as possible because if there's a deficit at the end of the day, you're responsible for that deficit. So uh, you, you want to work with the bank, keep, you want to keep the loan in the local branch as long as possible where you have that relationship and can work with them. Thanks. So Margo, I actually, um, I received a question from, from the audience here um, and I, I, I did kind of want to receive two of them. I thought maybe I'd get them out because we're kind of creeping up on the, uh, on time here. Um, and the first, and, and and hopefully we'll be able to have someone answer this one. I'm not sure, but it says, as an employee, if my employer 
files for bankruptcy, how do my benefits work? Do they extend beyond insolvency and bankruptcy? Uh, oh, I got a hand up. Yes, Chantel. Okay, so benefits. So if it's a full out bankruptcy and they, you know, their job ends with the process, then the benefits cease. Um, however, if they are owed unpaid salary, then there's um, there's a special pro government program called the Wage Earner Protection Plan, WEPA in my language, and that actually uh, secures some payment to unpaid employees. I'm not going to go into the minutia, but there is some protection there for, for salaried employees and commission-based employees that have not been paid unless you are a director or officer of the corporation. Um, but if we're talking about a proposal, then, it were, then the company is not ceasing to operate. And within a proposal, the employer would continue the benefits that they've established for their employees. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, now, the second question, this almost sounds more like an insurance question because I'm already trying to anticipate the, the answer, but maybe, maybe this is something for Fraser. I'm an investor of a small commercial real estate retail plaza. Are there any protections I can put in place to guard myself against potential tenant bankruptcies leading to vacancy? It sounds like business interruption insurance. I'm not sure if we have that. <laughs> yeah, that's, but that it's a great a question. question. I mean, yeah, it is a great question. It might be a question for Ted too, but I mean, ultimately it's, it's a decision that investors and owners and managers have to make in terms of their risk. So yeah, it's it's whether you get into personal indemnities, whether you get into security deposits, and you know what you feel your risk is going into the deal, and as well as what you feel your risk is if that person were to walk away from the space, how long it would take you to relet it, and maybe what the cost would be. So yeah, I agree. I mean, I think at the end of the day, your uh, uh, this gets down to the solidity of the original lease that you negotiated and the credit worthiness of the of the tenant the extent of the personal guarantee or other security that you have put in place to, to uh, protect yourself for the obligations of the tenant that the tenant seems to not be able to fulfill. I, beyond that, I'm not sure business interruption insurance would work. Uh, I think you'd, you'd, <laughs> you'd be stuck with not making a whole lot of money in your investment, uh, depending on how many plans. And of course, that's been a real problem over the last 18 months. Uh, with uh, with uh, so many spaces uh, becoming available now, that's uh, that's reversing now as people are seeing us come out of the pandemic. But you know, you still see a fair number of uh, vacancy signs, uh, and uh, and it, and yes, the, the pandemics uh, induce that. And I, the only word I have is patience. <laughs> you know, at some point that will totally reverse itself and just hang in there. People okay. should also talk to their CPAs. Now we don't have one. Uh, on this panel. Um, but let's not forget that everything that we're talking about today might have a fiscal either benefit or, or you know, the, there might be fiscal implications. I'll just leave it at that. So people should definitely consult their accountants, their CPAs in order to get the proper advice. And so I think this question might also be, you know, if I have a loss this year, how can I deal with the loss? And this is my structure. So that's an accountant question. That's a great point, uh, Chantel. Um, I'm just sort of looking at our time. Did, Warren, did you receive any other questions at this point? No, those were the, those were the only those two, were the that, two that came in. Um, one of the things when we um, thought about this group and this panel, and, and thank you so much. I think we've gotten so much incredible information. But we also, uh, and I think ending on a positive, like not that it's been, but, but a more positive uplifting note, um, you know, and obviously there's just so many players and businesses involved. I mean, I think we've really gotten appreciation while there's a business owner at the center of this, there's a whole bunch of business relationships that need to be managed, whether it's at the beginning or during the process, um, or after. And uh, we, we've talked about, you know, perhaps there's times when thinking about insolvency or bankruptcy, on the large scheme of things, it's a really good strategic option. You know, it actually makes a lot of sense to go through it. Um, <clears throat> and 
uh, and uh, I think part of dissuading some of the fears and so on, but maybe we can talk about about that a little bit and and just sort of, you know, you know when it does make sense and 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 you know strategically it's probably the best thing to to do. Um, Dave, I don't know if you want to start with that. I'm just going to put it over to you because you've certainly walked through it. Yep, for sure. I think it's. Uh... Um, I th so first of all, I think the, the there is I might leave some of the others to the actual bankruptcy itself in terms of the the benefits that can come through that. But I think one of the biggest things is is to be aware that <clears throat> bankruptcy is an expensive process, not just for the bankrupt, but for the people that are trying to get their money from that process. It's a long process, um, and and that can actually work. I'll say in the bankrupt's favor or the potentially bankrupt's favor in the sense that. You know, whether it's a landlord, whether whoever it is that's at the table here, they don't want to go through this process. And so that provides a lot of room when you're informed as the, the owner of your company on how you can negotiate and manage your pro way through this process. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of comp companies aren't stupid. Uh, company owners are not stupid. They recognize and they've seen when their, their, their vendors are in trouble or are going through problems. They have relationships with you personally. And so <clears throat> I just like to think of bankruptcy provides as like definitive, like, okay, this is the end point that we may be coming up to and facing, right? And that is, we all agree we don't want that. And that actually almost can bring people to the same table and saying that end point is not what we want, then we need to find alternative solutions to these things, no matter how painful that might be. Um, and it provides context to that conversation. And so, A, it helps with the process to be able to help work out what the right plans are to go through it. But it also helps to preserve relationships. You know, today uh, in my sort of 2.0 world, I deal with many of the vendors I dealt with prior to bankruptcy. And that was something I never imagined would be possible. I mean, I thought bankruptcy was kind of like an end and all that was just going to go away. And then I'd have to literally start from scratch. But reality is those relationships are still there. And, 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 and if you act with integrity, communicate effectively with people, all that can be preserved. And then the bankruptcy or the potential of bankruptcy, I'll say even, provides a way for everybody to get around the table to try and sort this out, to be able to get to the end point and get to a better place for everyone after the fact. And I think that's, that's, that's really key to this. Oh, Margo, here. Sorry, um, Chantal, did you, uh, did you have something? Sorry, else? Chantal, <laughs> I was on mute. I'm just, I'm just gonna, I, again, um, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act was built on two principles. The first principle is the principle of fresh start. So it's allowing for a, an honest and unfortunate debtor um, to, you know, to have a fresh start, um, whether that be a corporate, you know, an individual or director of a corporation. And it's also built on equity. So ensuring that all stakeholders have equitable treatment. So if you look at those principles, and those are the principles that I have to, to navigate through, I mean, it, it, it's there. Because if you're stuck in a scenario where you, you feel that you can't get out of, then, you know, that's why, that's why it's there. It, it's, it's allowing for a fresh start, new beginnings, and um, it has a bad stigma, but that's not the intent. Right. Excellent. So I'm just looking at our time and we only have a few minutes left. Um, Warren, I was just thinking maybe we can go around and just um, ask everybody, you know, sort of your sort of summary points that you'd like to share with, you know, everybody who will, uh, who's here today and be viewing this in the future. Um, you know, I've definitely heard about the ability to have, use your strong business relationships, act early, act with integrity, communicate and so on. But maybe we'll just go around and ask um, if there's sort of summary points that anybody would like to make. Fraser, I'll start with you. Uh, I think I'm gonna go back to Chantel's comment about penny wise but pound poor. And I, I guess my comment would be to surround yourself with the right people. Like, you know, we've talked about speaking to your CPA. We've talked about speaking to your lawyer. We've talked about, you know, whether you speak to your real estate broker, there's a lot of people out there that are there to help you. And I, I don't think anybody should try and manage the process alone. I mean, you're, Dave will like, be the first to say that you're going through a very stressful time. And there's a lot of things that you may think about at one point and then forget the next day or down the road. So 
I think it makes a lot of sense to make sure that you've surrounded yourself with the right people who can help you navigate through it and understand the best outcome for everybody. Ted, what about you? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Fraser. I think, uh, again, at the risk of sounding uh, either self-centered or, or self-serving, I think seeing an insolvency lawyer before you go to see Chantal is of, ex of great value. And it's not thousands of dollars. I wish it were, but it's not. It's, it's relatively inexpensive advice. Uh, and uh, it's, it's well worth getting. And then the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is, is that you, what you are contemplating insolvency have lived with, with uh, uh, robbing Peter to pay so long uh, that they can't appreciate that that can end and that they can end up, they can end up with their life back. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's not a negative process at all. It's in fact, a very positive one as Chantel also has said, that's it. Great, Chantel. Yeah, um, again, I'm gonna go around these lines. Consult before it's too late and before you make decisions that you will regret. Um, and depleting your personal assets is, is one that I often see people at the end of the day, regret. So, I mean, it takes going through a process takes a lot of soul searching um, and uh, a lot of honesty towards yourself uh, as an officer of a corporation or a sole proprietor. Um, but again, there are people to help you navigate through these processes. That's great. And Dave, uh, and I should add, Dave, uh, someone who's been really, really honest and open, we can't uh, thank you enough for that, but who also incidentally has now has this, another business, which is highly successful, a uh, real rocket ship taking off. So a great testimony to that fresh start. Any comments from you? Sure. I mean, I think that I won't get, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, that um, uh absolutely do not go through this alone. I mean, that is certainly your lawyer, CPA, and all the people you mentioned. But I'm going to also throw a couple of things out there. One is um, find somebody else, another entrepreneur who's been through this process to talk to. I think that is extremely, extremely valuable. If you can find someone else out there who has been through this and can just give you some of those words of encouragement, a little piece of advice, a little bit of cues to look at where you're at and that familiarity, um, will be there to help. So if you can find someone there that can do that. The second thing that really made a huge difference for me, <clears throat> um, I was a member and continue to be a member of a, a tech group um, that uh, says Tech Canada. So it's a peer network of, of CEOs. And uh, I have to say for that, probably of a six month period there, I went through this, which is a support other CEOs, other founders, organizations, in my case, um, to help get through this process, to help provide advice, information, was immensely valuable and, and just provide, provided me that uh, something to lean on to be able to help get through this process and make it work. So people, people, people is really, really key. Do not shelter on your own. You're not on your own. And there's a lot of people out here that are ready to help. So, uh, and that's that's really, most people here want this to have a good conclusion. And that's, um, that's really what it all boils down to. So uh, if I can pass that along, I think that's will be very valuable for people. That's wonderful. Thanks, Dave. Um, I know it's a sales analogy. Uh, they say, you know, dig the well before you get thirsty. But uh, if you're digging that well and surrounding yourself with good people like lawyers and, and mentors and, 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 you know, if you have a good relationship with your landlord, it can, it can certainly benefit, um, benefit you and, and the entire process. I was, I was honestly concerned that 90 minutes was going to be too long and, and we'd end up tripping over ourselves. And, we had 26 questions and two from the audience participation, and I doubt we got through half of them. Uh, the, the content, uh, I hope, is by all the listeners and attendees and the folks that have a chance to review this and watch this in the future find nothing but benefit. I hope our phones start ringing uh, with people with questions and comments. Uh, that would be, that's the goal, that's the intent to, to provide uh, for the Ottawa Board of Trade to provide this as a resource not only to its members, but, but to anyone who wants, who wants to listen. So uh, thank you so much. Um, giving your gift uh, of time to us is extremely important. And, and, and on behalf of everyone, I'd like to say thank you to Ted, Chantel, Frazier, and Dave. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, Margot, for, for your energy and effort behind this endeavor as well. So 
Um, Aren't you or two? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Thanking myself. It's such yeah. a broker move. Um, <laughs> stop laughing, Frazier. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll wrap it up. We'll, we'll, we'll conclude it. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out to the audience members, to any of the panelists. I'm sure they'll be happy to take your call. Uh, I know it's a very sensitive subject, um, and uh, I, I know that they'll they'll treat it with 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 respect, and 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 the opportunity will be uh, certainly rewarded with some great advice. So, uh, on behalf of the Ottawa Board of Trade, Margo and myself, thank you so much, and uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you very Bye much. Now.